So culture is kind of a messy word in sociology. And I, I describe it as a messy word because often people mean different things when they use the word culture. If we think back to our lecture on validity and reliability in, in research methodology, that's actually kind of a problem because you want people when using a word to mean the same kind of thing. Otherwise, it's hard to have reliable analysis. In general, sociological research on culture is committed to the idea that the symbolic and expressive aspects of social life, that is, the beliefs and values in we hold as well as the practices we engage in, are worth examination. I want to repeat that because it's, it's kind of important. Um, or it's actually very important. And in the subsequent set of three lectures, I'll outline this in an even greater way. Sociological research on culture is committed to the idea that the symbolic and expressive aspects to social life, that is the beliefs and values we hold, as well as the practices or activities that we engage in, are worth examination. We may here follow the work of Emile Durkheim, and see culture as symbols and beliefs that are deployed through rituals that in turn generate meaning for people. I'm going to spend a lot of time in on that insight in a subsequent lecture. We can also think of culture by differentiating between three tensions embedded within the concept, between high culture and popular culture, between material and symbolic culture, and between culture as values and culture as activity. And I'm going to begin with these three insights, thinking about the distinction between high and popular culture, thinking about the relationship between material culture and symbolic culture, and thinking about a distinction between culture as values and culture as activity. Now, if you didn't get that, don't worry, because actually it's going to organize our discussion for this lecture, these three distinctions. Often connecting all of these themes is a relationship between culture and inequality. And the study of sociology is frequently the study of inequality. That is, it's a study of the ways in which different factors that we're interested in are related to inequality. So the study of race is often tied to the study of inequality. Um, The study of gender is often tied to the study of inequality. The study of urban neighborhoods and space is tied to the study of inequality, and the study of culture is. And in the final lecture of this, I'm going to talk really explicitly about that when referring to the work of Pierre Bourdieu. Over the course of these culture lectures, I'm going to discuss and revisit um, our understanding of Max Weber and his critical work in culture. I'm going to add to it work from Ann Squidler, um, a contemporary scholar who's done really pioneering work in how it is that we can understand culture. And we're going to talk about Emile Durkheim, another classic theorist of culture. And then finally, Pierre Bourdieu, someone who was writing in the second half of the 20th century and one of the most influential sociologists of the 20th century. So the first distinction I wanted to make was between material and symbolic culture. So Sociologically, material culture and symbolic culture are thought of as somewhat distinct but interrelated things. Material culture are physical goods often placed within an economic system. So I've shown here on this slide an example, a little bit of an example of material culture. When people go on vacation, one of the things that they typically do is they buy things. They buy things like here we see a series of potentially local or indigenous products that are being produced. In this instance, likely being produced in order to be sold to tourists, but they are meant to represent something as well. And so the material culture here are the physical goods that different groups produce and place in an economic system. There are lots of goods that people produce. Their physical nature of them Um, can actually be widely understood. So there are goods that people produce, like music, which we could think of as kind of physical. Um, um, And and there are things that we use to kind of represent ourselves, as well as to actually accrue economic capital or to accrue money to sell them on markets. So we might ask, what are the physical goods that we place within an economic system? And how is it that those do those goods reflect our culture. 
So, you know, there are different cultures that produce different kinds of objects. In um, the 17th and 18th century, into the 19th century, one of the things that people were really interested in, in terms of material goods, was porcelain. And if you think of the word in English, China, it has two meanings. The first meaning is the nation of China. The second is that people often refer to their finely constructed plates and cups and saucers and other things like as China. That is, I have my fine China in my house. It's the nice plates that I put on the table to serve when I have formal company coming over. Now, part of this is because the material culture of porcelain production was deeply associated with the nation of China, with the, emperor, um, the empire of China at the time. And so here, the material culture, the physical goods that were placed into an economic system for sale reflected in some ways the cultural landscape and cultural production of a place. And when you go to different places around the country or even different parts of the city, often people are placing physical goods into markets as a representation of their culture. This is material culture. Symbolic culture are the beliefs, values, and representations of a group. So um, this is not typically just, uh, or not typically a material object, but instead something about what it is that we think how it is that we value things, and what are, to use the word, the symbolic representations that we construct of ourselves in order to understand ourselves. Think about something you wear, how it has a material component. It has fabric, it has dye, and, and there's a way in which that clothing is produced. It also has a symbolic component. It has words or images or a particular style that represents itself. Larger bundles of material and symbolic culture can be thought of as the collective representations of a group of people. So, you know, um, I want to give an example here, maybe drawing upon my porcelain or china example, where one of the main objects that is made within um, uh, uh, China that people often own is a tea set a set of a teapot with saucers and cups. And this is an element of people's fine china. Um, and usually we use the word fine china um, to make a distinction between things that are very well made and valuable to us versus our everyday china. And we'll return to that when we talk about Durkheim. Well, a tea set has a material component to it. It looks like a physical object. It is put into a market often that people buy but it also has a symbolic component to it. That is, serving and consuming tea with other people often has beliefs, values, and rituals associated with it. This happens across the world. Someone comes into your house and you seek to make them a cup of tea. What you're partially doing is conveying to them the, de the belief that they are a guest in your space, that they are welcome, that you are going to give them a gift, that you're going to share in a ritual together, a ritual of tea drinking. And often there are ways in which we participate in that ritual. So I want you to think about how the world is made up of material objects, which in some ways represent us, and that those material objects also have a symbolic component. They reflect our beliefs, our values, um, and some internal sense of who we are. We can relate some of this to Karl Marx, who said to us that the way to understand a society is to think about the ways in which they produce and what they produce. And so the production of things is, is in some ways a representation of self. As a student right now, one of the things that you're doing is attempting to find a work, a kind of work that's going to be of interest to you that is going to represent who you are. And the production of that work is in some ways a representation of self. And it has both a material and a symbolic component. When I said that larger bundles of material and symbolic culture can be understood as collective representations, I want you to think about for a moment the collective representations that we all have and share. So you can think perhaps about the collective representations of the 
academic institution that you are a part of or of the national culture that you're from. I'm from the United States. And there is a material and symbolic culture to one, some of our own nationalistic collective representations. The American flag is a materially cultural, material culture object. It is something that is produced and sold on markets. You can go into a shop and, that you, bu- and you buy one. But it also has a symbolic component. It's imbued with a set of beliefs and meanings and values among people. And together, the flag constructs a kind of collective representation among American citizens, both in its materiality as an object, the physical quality of the object itself, and the symbolic element of the object, the ways in which it represents something about who we collectively are. Now, the collectivity there can be in in part of a contention. So some of us with these collective representations may say, that flag represents imperialism, oppression, a history of slavery, a way in which America is a violent player on the national stage. Others will say something quite different. No, no, no. What that flag represents is freedom, open markets, the, a beautiful idea of opportunity. And the flag represents all the potential and the reality that the United States is. And so you'll have different and competing senses of what the symbolic and representative aspects of material objects are. The sociology of culture is a study of this phenomenon. It's also a study of the ways in which those material objects and collective representations are patterned so that they're not totally consistent across the population. Just as I said that the flag can be interpreted differently across different groups of people, we can extend this and also say that different kinds of objects or cultural representations are highly patterned with different groups. High culture, or what some scholars call high culture, is commonly attuned to elite and upper middle class tastes and sensibilities and has an aura that denotes it as being exceptional in its quality. Popular culture, on the other hand, is commonly associated with pleasure with the mundane, and with the masses. Now, I said that high culture has an aura of quality to it, in part because often the ways in which we understand cultural objects suggest that there's something inherent to the object that produces our understanding of it. So, for example, classical music is something that is complicated and requires a lot of skill and is intellectually sophisticated. But I want to suggest that our understanding, or some people's understanding of classical music in that way, has nothing to do with classical music, and everything to do with the types of people who are associated with classical music. So the interpretation that we place upon classical music is not just relative to the object itself, but it's tied to who that object is associated with. Heavy metal music, by contrast, is deeply associated with working class and poorer whites and is therefore seen as somehow simpler, less developed. But there's nothing inherent to heavy metal music that's actually true about that. Instead, what it often is, is the association between the statuses of people and the kinds of culture that they like that produce our interpretation or understanding of cultural objects. A different way of putting this is that cultural objects may not have the kinds of qualities that we think they have because of the material materiality of the object itself. Instead, it's the set of symbolic resources that people bring to the object who tend to be associated. So I want to give you some examples of this drawing on the U.S. case. And this is um, a data from a decade of arts engagement, a study that was done. And it asks, you know, by family income, what percentage of um, the U.S. population participates in ballet or classical music or jazz, goes to an art museum, opera, a musical, or a play? In other words, what people, what kinds of, 
what kinds of people participate in particular kinds of cultural expression. And one of the things that you see here is that the wealthiest people who make up 8% of um, the American population, that is people who make up more than $150,000 a year, make up 28% of the people who participate in this kind of culture. And the poor, poorer people, people who make less than $20,000 a year, which is 17% of the American population, engage very little in this kind of cultural expression. Now, it's not the case that poor people don't engage in culture or in music of, of some kind, et cetera. It's just that they don't go to classical music concerts. They're less likely to go to museums. You won't find them at the opera. Um, and so part of the ways in which we interpret culture, as I've said before, is deeply tied to the kinds of people who participate in that culture. And as we'll talk about a lot later, one of the things that we do is to construct boundaries, symbolic boundaries around culture in order to kind of both protect our social status and have this affiliation with cultural objects. Another way to think about this is that culture is not simply a reflection of our distinct individual tastes. Instead, it's structured. Recall the opening lectures of this course, the ways in which human agency is patterned by social structure, so that social structural phenomena, things like your organizational affiliations, your um, uh, backgrounds, your social statuses, produce the kinds of actions that you undertake which then reproduce those social structures. Again, this theme is going to emerge and it'll emerge again and again and again throughout the course. And the critical insight here is that culture is not just a reflection of our individual tastes. Instead, it's a product of institutional um, and structural dynamics, which are deeply tied to social status. And so the meaning of cultural objects is tied up with the group of people who enact and interact with those cultural objects.